<clears throat> Thanks very much, Chair, and you're all very welcome, and I very much appreciate your, 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 your presentations. I think it's the view of the Committee that this is our one chance to reform the Leaving Cert really in a generation after coming out of this pandemic. And it is true to say that it is largely unchanged from the time that we were all uh, traumatised by it uh, back in the day when we did it. Um, to my mind, there's a number of things we have to address, but there's two in particular. One is what school is like for people going through it, for young people going through it, for children going through it, are they studying things that they're interested in? And secondly is how they assess those, how those things are assessed. So you could have a great experience in school where you're studying things that you're actually interested in or learning things that you're actually interesting, in, interested in, uh, but the, the model of assessing as to what, what you know is so brutal. Uh, or you could have a situation where you're not that interested actually, because the, what you're being asked to learn doesn't reflect who you are, where you're from, your background, your heritage, your culture, um, the interests of the, of, the, of the locality that you're from. You're asked to study things which are completely alien to you. Uh, and then you're asked to go through an assessment process um, that is also quite brutal and doesn't, doesn't reflect uh, your abilities and how, and how you learn. Um, as we know, 15% of uh, students who go to DESH second level schools don't make it as far as leaving cert. And we have a, pre a reasonably uh, high level of attainment until leaving cert year. I think it's about 91%, which reflects pretty well internationally, but it's 85% in DESH schools. I have a few statistics for you here in terms of uh, the number of DESH schools where not a single student studies higher level English at leaving cert. There's 31 schools, 31 DESH schools in the Republic where not a single student does higher level English. There's 39 where not a single, does, single student does higher level maths. And there's 41 where not a single student does higher level Irish. So in terms of higher level Irish, for example, there is 41 schools, 41 second level schools, where not a single student can become a primary school teacher. Now, that is either because not everybody is good at Irish or because the school has determined that they can't justify the resources for somebody who may be uh, good at Irish. And this is what happened actually during the whole uh, issue around the assessed grading for the Leaving Cert where members of this committee were quite strongly against the idea of school profiling. What if you are the one who is in order, or you know, one of a small number who has the ability and wants to, to, to power through and break through disadvantage, break through poverty? How are you going to do it when the entire you know, context of your school is, is, is mitigating against you? Because we have a second level system which is based on competition. Schools compete against each other. And they try to give, you know, you know, they have this whole reputation thing going on. So they have open days. So my questions really are, are about, in your, and again, I know I'm supposed to direct it to individual people, but uh, the way I like to ask, ask questions is, you know, it's also we're, we're interested in, in answering them rather than, you know, sort of um, uh, putting people on the spot. How do we assess those things? One, how do we, how do we, produce a school experience that is reflective of, of young people and what they know and what they want to learn. Secondly, how do we produce a model that can assess that? But thirdly, how, do we, how have we come to a situation where we have schools that are absolutely failing their young people um, because of the competition model that we've insisted upon? 41 schools in this republic cannot produce a primary school teacher because not one single student either has access to or has been empowered enough uh, to do higher level Irish. Niall. Thank you very much, Deputy. Um, I suppose there's a couple of things in our, in our submission. One that I think would fit here is um, the concept of using digital learning that we've, we've all been forced into in the last two years. We would see an opportunity for classes to be live streamed to those students in those classes that you're talking about, those schools you're talking about. Can we exactly. partner up the big schools that are doing live stream? You don't need an extra staff for it. You need a child, that one child who wants to power through can sit in their classroom, watch the class in, in Dublin or wherever it might be, and learn from it. There's schools like that all over the country where maybe five or six children want to do something, a subject. There's a shortage of certain language teachers as well, so again, we can create opportunities for the, for the one language teacher to stream or record for other students to get that, those opportunities. I think there's a huge um, benefit from that. There's also students who may not be able to access school, you know, behavioural issues, may have to be able to do it from home, may have mental health difficulties, may be in the hospital. So live streaming and recording of classes can be a huge benefit for those sort of children as well. 
The assessment, I think, again, you talk about the overall situation. Can we provide students an opportunity to do stuff they're interested in? One of the recommendations we made as well was the concept of reducing the number of subjects they do, so from seven to five, and allow one day a week to do a subject they want to do, to do something they want to do, not even a subject. It could be farming, it could be uh, metalwork, it could be hairdressing, it could be landscape gardening, it could be charity work, it could be working with children. And they get assessed, they do a video blog, they get interviewed, whatever, the same way TY, there's lots of opportunities to assess those types of things, which again gives the holistic opportunity to those children. And uh, the pieces that are really, really important so that the child gets more rounded understanding of what's valued by us as a society. Yeah. What's valued by us as a society is what you're interested in, young man or young girl. And we want to see you develop that. It may never become a, jo a job, but it will also make you better at what you do in those other five subjects because you'll have had that opportunity. So I think there's, there's a couple of opportunities there. And again, this concept of, of the review, the, the Leaving Cert review, when we talk about it not coming into being until 2030, I did a calculation. If you assume 60,000 children do it every year, Leaving Cert, since 2016 when the UN committee heard from our children in Ireland and asked us to review, by 2030 you will have 800,000 children gone through that system in the same way as it always was. So we've got to speed up in that process. And again, the voices of children need to be put high, high in that um, planning. And I think the way uh, Dara said it earlier was fantastic. It's time to give the Leaving Cert back to the students. Exactly, I don't think yeah. they were ever with the students. It was never designed by the students. It was never asked. The students were never asked. The NCCA have asked them. They've got great feedback from students. We need to put that front and centre all the way through and do it quickly. That's probably the strongest statement I heard actually today was, was from you, Dara, was giving the leaving cert back to the students. And I don't, Tanya, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Peter, yeah, yeah I want yeah. to come in on, on that as well. I mean, it, it's a really critical point that you're raising. Um, and what really strikes me, it's not just about, let's say, the school doesn't necessarily have the resources uh, to organise the higher level for the child. There's also an issue, and it comes up th uh, from all the representative groups, is aspirations that sometimes educators have low aspirations for the children and young people in their schools. And the, the, the centres and educators that have high aspirations, that motivates a child or a young person. When you hear someone that tells you, doesn't matter what the obstacle is, you can do it. It just changes how you think about yourself. And it's one of the big things that people living in poverty hear all the time. And unfortunately, it's experienced for many of us within the education sector. So I would have been that child. I was that child um, in uh, past classes. Um, and the only way I got to university was my parents paid for grinds to get me through. Exactly. Right? That's yeah. the only way they got, I, I got yeah. out of it. Yeah. Now, here is the thing I suppose we need to think about. There's a very good study that's just been done by NUI Galway evaluating um, alternative education providers like the Life Centre and Skullnet. And some of the things that are coming through in terms of the findings, um, and it was really striking because they were saying things like a person-centred approach made a big difference. And these are young people that have been on reduced hours in school. They had we were told they'd never get to third level, and they did get on to third level, and they got on to their, they, they got they got on to their career. So that seems to be a critical point. But the other thing was having high aspirations as well. That was really critical. That's what the young people said, and that's what the provider said as well. Um, and. I wonder about that because I, I, mean, I looked at the findings and I was like, well, this is probably what happens when you go to a private school. <laughs> this is the kind of approach that you get. Everyone tells you that it's okay, you're going to get there. And I think that's probably something missing within the education system at large. The other thing that comes through as well is if you are in education, uh, if you're a principal or a school and you want to upskill in this area, there's very few places for you to go. You know, we don't have a forum, we don't have a forum where these providers can come together and exchange information on methodologies and teaching and learning approaches. And I think that's another gap as well for providers in schools. So let's say the school says, yeah, we, we, we do have these talented young people coming up. What can we do to shift the direction of where they're going on? They have nowhere to go. They have to go off, the principals have to go off and investigate themselves what they can do, but there's nowhere for the principal to go to upskill and train and for other people within the centre to upskill and train as well. And I think that's a gap that has to be looked at as well. Okay. I think my, my, time, my time is up, Chair, but I, if Dara could... Dara come in, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, to, just to mention, because we're actually one of the projects that were part of that evaluation with NUIG uh, in Galway, and Aspirations has been a, a key piece of that work that we do in, in CityWise and other programmes. And mainly that's because, um, you know, I, 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 I always remember a, a case uh, that was reported in the paper a couple of years ago in our local area where there was a student in, in, a, in a local school who was, who was sitting higher level maths 
and that was you know in the paper and that was fantastic for that student but that that's something that shouldn't ever have to be that's not news you know um, and that's you know I think that places like community organisations have have a have a part to play in this when we talk about you know the need for groins and the extra academic help you know places like Citywise have been um, providing that service you know for for people who are you know are unable to afford it and, and and give them that you know step up to a level playing field and I'd, I'd also like to kind of echo um, what's already been mentioned by some of the other um, witnesses here today um, so whether that's you know face-to-face -face opportunities within community organisations, which we can centralise classes like that. We can centralise, you know, maths and higher level maths and higher level Irish and English, whatever it might be, um, or, or the digital kind of mode that, you know, we're all accustomed to now. But I think at the minute we're kind of fiddling around the edges and I think there's, there's an opportunity to do something structural here, which gives students the flexibility to, to dictate and be, and be leaders and, and, and agents in their own learning where they're deciding what, what they want to do and projects they can take up. Um, but but that, that aspiration piece is, is key and that's been something that's been missing in, in underserved areas because of the intergenerational aspect of it. Um, so that's a, a piece of work that really needs to be done. Thanks, Mian. Thanks, Jay.